Well, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining Housing Forward Massachusetts for our Housing Choice in Action training. My name is Josh Zakem. I am the Executive Director of Housing Forward Mass and pleased uh, to introduce uh, our esteemed panel and uh, give you a brief outline of the program today. Uh, really appreciate everyone's attendance uh, and interest uh, in this very important issue in Massachusetts. I also want to thank uh, Eric of Spy Pond Productions uh, for his incredible help in putting this together uh, from a video and technical standpoint, as well as Kendall Feynman, our Director of Policy and External Relations, uh, who will be organizing uh, the Q&A later on and really helped us put this together. As many of you know, or I would expect everyone here knows, uh, housing choice legislation was recently enacted in Massachusetts, uh, and it's a true game changer in how significant developments and projects uh, and housing uh, can be approved and created across the Commonwealth. And an important tool uh, in the toolkit for this housing creation is Chapter 40R uh, for smart growth. And we believe that more information about 40R is incredibly important for activists, uh, residents, local and state officials to have to make sure we're putting all the tools we have to use to create more housing, more affordable middle-income housing uh, across the Commonwealth of Maine. Massachusetts. As we continue with a brief program, it'll be about 35 minutes, uh, and then we're going to have plenty of time for question and answer with our three esteemed panelists at the end. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation, please drop them in the Q&A box uh, or in the chat box, and we'll make sure that they get answered towards uh, after the presentation. So with that, um, I will now begin our presentation, and thank you all for being here and participating. Hello, I'm Eleanor White, President of Housing Partners, Inc., which is an affordable housing consulting firm. Before this, I served for 15 years at HUD, 12 years as co-CEO of what is now Mass Housing, and have been a founding owner of Housing Partners since 1995. I'm going to be telling you the story of 40R and 40S. In 20. 2002 and 2003, Ted Carman, who will join us shortly, presented to a statewide task force an idea for a new housing production program. He was joined by Barry Bluestone, also on this panel, and myself to further develop the idea. The program, which would become 40R, was meant to confront the fact that due to very restrictive zoning, much too little multifamily housing at small homes at various income levels were being produced in Massachusetts. This led to a loss of population and was becoming a drag on the economy. Much to our delight, 40R was passed into law in record time by mid-2004. A year later, in November 2005, 40S was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor. A companion to 40R, it provided that if the local cost of educating K-12 students in the new Chapter 40R housing exceeded approximately 50% of the property taxes paid by the 40R development, the state would step in annually and make up the difference. Although this sounds like a small item, this provision removed the frequent objection by communities that they could not afford to educate the students that might live in new family housing. This was a major cause of objection to affordable housing. The Chapter 40R Smart Growth Zoning and Housing Production Program is voluntary available to all communities in the Commonwealth. Its goal is to produce sufficient land zoned as of right to accommodate increased production of higher density housing in smart growth locations with at least 20% of the units available to families at 80% of median income. It includes financial benefits to participating communities. 
So that's a little dense in itself. Let's unpack that a bit. It's voluntary and available to all communities. In developing 40R, we envisioned it as the voluntary carrot to the chapter 40B snob zoning stick. So communities would themselves decide to pursue 40R and would decide where they wanted housing to be built. Further, since the goal is to increase the amount of land zone as of right across the Commonwealth, we wanted the program to be usable by all cities and towns. And we felt financial incentives wouldn't hurt. Zoned as of right, in 2004, and still today, except for 40R, there is virtually no land zoned as of right for moderate density multifamily housing and single family housing on small lots in Massachusetts. The result is that developers of this housing face a daunting, expensive, and lengthy process to permit their projects requiring either rezoning or special permits. Higher density housing in smart locations. We felt that housing development should be encouraged in locations near public transit, near city and town centers, and on underutilized commercial, industrial, or institutional property. Those became the eligible locations for a 40R district. Density was pegged at a minimum of 20 units per acre for multifamily, 12 units per acre for townhouses, and eight units per acre for single family homes. Although developers are not required to build at the zoned allowable densities. Hint, most developers do wanna maximize density on their sites, but they're not required to. With at least 20% of the units available to families at 80% of median income. Although we believe that any housing production helps address housing needs across the economy, the need for affordable housing has always been especially acute. Further, supporting mixed income housing unlocks public sources of financing for the housing developments. The carrots. Once a 40R zoning district is adopted by the local governing body, the community is entitled to an immediate financial bonus from the state. Actual construction of housing in the district depends upon a developer, nonprofit, for-profit, or public, pursuing a development consistent with the 40R zoning, and the community receives another payment upon issuance of building permits in the district. The community also gets bonus, bonus points in competitions for other state funding. Further, under the companion program, Chapter 40S, the school cost insurance policy, as I said before, the state will pay for any shortfall of school costs for all children attending public school that live in new units built in these districts. Ted Carmen will be walking you shortly through how 40R and 40S work on the ground, but I'll give you a very brief overview of the local process. Three steps. One, the community selects an eligible location for a chapter 40R district and prepares an application to go to the Mass Department of Housing and Community Development prior to any local zoning vote. As part of preparing the application, the community presents to its citizens the zoning concept, the proposed zoning ordinance, and usually design guidelines, and these become part of the application. This part of the process may take many months, but assures that when the community is ready to vote the zoning, it is assured that the location and local guidelines are acceptable to the state. Second, 
the local governing body votes to adopt the 40R district. Recent legislation has provided that this can be accomplished by a simple majority vote in most cases. Third, upon local passage and final DHCD certification, the community can collect the first bonus and begin to entertain development proposals within the district. Now that you've gotten an overview of chapters 40R and 40S, Barry Bluestone will tell you how these programs support economic development priorities within the Commonwealth. Thanks much. Hello, I'm Barry Bluestone, and I'm proud to be the president of Housing Forward Massachusetts. What I'd like to do is share with you some of the latest data we have on home prices, condo prices, on rents, and what this all means, not only for working families, but what it means for all of us. So let me share my screen so you can see some slides that I've prepared for you. In this first slide, you'll see median single family home prices for greater Boston communities in 2018. And what we mean by the median is that half of all homes sell for less than that and half sell for more than that. And what we find is that in working class neighborhoods like Revere, Everett, Chelsea, Malden, Quincy, Braintree, as of 2018, the median price ranged from $435,000 for a single family home to nearly a half a million dollars, clearly outside the range of what most, most working families can afford. If we look at why those prices have increased so much, we'll see that it is because uh, over the last five years, they've soared. Uh, in Chelsea, the median price of a home increased by 90%. In Revere and Everett, 68%. In Lynn, 55%. So over the last five years, well, between 2013 and 2018, prices rose by enormous amounts uh, so that today, uh, working class homes are valued at $500,000 and in some communities, even more. If we look at condo prices, we see very much the same thing. Uh, the least expensive uh, neighborhoods of Boston, like Mattapan and West Roxbury and Roxbury, the median price of a two-bedroom condo is somewhere between $300,000 and $450,000. Again, uh, meaning that most working class families could never afford to buy into the condo market, let alone the single family market. And the reason why those condo prices are so high today is they have soared over the last five years between 2013 and 2018. Indeed, in Mattapan, condo prices increased by 161%. In Hyde Park, in Alston, they more than doubled, 106, 109%. And even in Roxbury, they were up 82%. Now, what about rents? If we look at rents, we see the same thing. Uh, we, if we take the monthly rent and multiply it by 12 so that we get the annual rent, we'll find out that across communities in greater Boston, uh, you'd have to pay between $25,000 and $42,000 to rent a two-bedroom apartment. And if a family is to afford all the other things they need and can be expected to spend no more than 30% of their income on rent, then that means families need to have an income of at least $84,000, as much as $140,000 to afford a typical apartment in many of the neighborhoods of Boston and in the greater Boston community. Now, why is this such a problem? Well, obviously the first thing you think about is poor working families. They cannot find a place to live in Boston and we should worry about that. But in fact, this is now affecting all of us because the housing crisis has become so severe over the last five years that the population of Massachusetts has begun to decline. In fact, if we look at our next slide, we see that between 2009 and 2014, the population increased average about three quarters of a percent, about 0.75% per year. But once those home prices started to explode, once condo prices rose, once the rents rose so quickly, the population of Massachusetts has declined to only 48 hundredths of a percent, less than half a percent in 2015, to less than one third of a percent in 2018. And then last year, 
the population actually declined. More people left the state than came into Massachusetts. And that was particularly true in the greater Boston area where prices of housing were so high. So what does that mean? Well, one of the things it does, it means that we're going to have a serious problem in the economy. And the reason why we'll have that problem in the economy is that we need new workers to replace older baby boomers who are retiring. The latest data from the Executive Office of Employment and Workforce Development in the Commonwealth tells us that we're going to need more than 1,100 additional new machinists per year just to fill openings. We're going to need nearly 1,800 automotive service technicians to fill openings uh, among firms in the, in the Commonwealth. And if you look at things like medical assistance, we'll need 1,700. And the all-important home health aides who will take care of us in our older age and when we need nursing care, 4,400 openings per year. And of course, these are jobs that often pay much less than is necessary to afford housing in the Commonwealth. So what does that mean? It means we're running out of workers as the population declines. It means employers are not going to be able to fill job openings. Some employers will have to leave the state in order to find uh, the workers they need. And what that will mean is that the housing crisis is not only devastating to people who want to live here but can't afford it, but it's going to affect all of us as the economy of the Commonwealth begins to decline because it can't fill the employment needs we have. Unless we can solve the housing crisis, unless we can produce enough housing in order to meet demand, unless we can find housing at much more affordable prices, not only are working families in trouble in Massachusetts, we all are. We need to find ways of building the housing we need for everyone, not only so that we can house people who want to be here, but so that we can maintain the strength of the Massachusetts economy for all of us. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Ted Carmen. I'm president of Concord Square Planning and Development, and I'm absolutely delighted to be on this panel with Eleanor White and Barry Bluestone. The three of us spent two and a half years working hard on Chapter 40R and 40S a number of years ago. And it's a pleasure to be here today to uh, provide information about how the program works and how it can work in the future. I have spent decades working in local communities and doing housing development. And I think it's fair to say that chapter 40R and 40S are the result of all of this experience, plus a desire to put in the hands of the communities, the tools that they need to really control how their communities development, how, they, how their communities develop, uh, the shape and the location of properties. It gives this, the programs give them tools and it also provides financial incentives. So we, we hope that, uh, uh, that it can be a, a, a real way to move forward with the community's needs. Barry's analysis was very persuasive in his description of the loss of population that's been taking place because of high housing costs. And the result of that is going to be not enough workers. And the further result of that is going to be a slowing of job growth. The good news is that the housing choice bill that the governor, the legislature, many advocates and others work so hard on, we think has dramatically changed the landscape. In the past, it took a two thirds vote from either city council or town meeting to pass a chapter 40R zoning district. The problem with that is if you have any organized opposition, it's almost, well, it's very easy for them to get a third of the people in the community to vote no. 50% is going to make it a lot harder for them. And so this 50% threshold will make it much easier to get projects approved. In addition, the choice bill also made it possible for judges to require that a litigation, those who litigate to stop a project may have to provide bonds that they forfeit in the event the project, uh, they're, they're unsuccessful. That could, ease, that could get rid of nuisance suits that often delay projects by several years. So we think the housing choice bill really 
is going to go a long way to making it more feasible for developers and communities to per pursue Chapter 40R. And even having said that, results to date, there are 56 districts across the Commonwealth in 45 communities and 23,700 total zoned units, a significant amount, which with housing choice, we think can be much greater uh, in the years going forward. The types of situations where 40R makes sense are situations where a consensus can be achieved around the project because you really can't do these projects without a local consensus. So what's gotten a lot of traction in the years to date is downtowns of gateway cities like Brockton, Fitchburg, Worcester, and so forth. But in fact, and in fact, downtowns of almost any community uh, can use chapter 40R effectively. Uh, and these days with shopping centers uh, going under, uh, defunct shopping centers and faded office parks are possibilities. In Woburn, Avalon Properties has developed a 350 unit housing project on the old Woburn Mall. In Wellesley at the corner of the intersection of Route 9 and Route 128, a developer is building 350 apartment units. In both those cases, the incentives for the local community amounted to a million dollars or more. So really this offers quite an opportunity for communities to deal with parts of the community that are uh, not doing well financially. Also older industrial buildings like mill buildings are good candidates. Uh, having said all of that, locations must be smart growth locations as defined by DHCD. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here. It's common sense. Uh, situations where there are commercial centers, where there's pedestrian access and so forth. I'd also like to stop for a minute and just make note of an example in Beverly uh, where the nonprofit Harbor Light spent several years developing a consensus uh, program to deal with homeless needs in Beverly, Danvers and Peabody and Salem. Uh, they de designed a project specifically for families and for homeless families. It was a modest five acre site. It was ultimately zoned for up to hundred units. All the units are two and three bedrooms. There are 75, well, all the units are two and three bedrooms. And what I wanna say is 75 apartments there could easily result in 75 to 80 school aged children. So in this case, chapter 40S, which provides annual payments to the local school system uh, to make up the difference between the property taxes from the project and the cost of educating the children was absolutely uh, crucial in obtaining the consensus which allowed the zoning to pass the city council in December of 2017 with a unanimous vote. And that really represents uh, a consensus that was developed in the community. Uh, and the good news is construction is starting this summer on phase one. So this is a template. I don't think anybody else has attempted to do this, but it's a really good way to uh, produce housing for families that need it uh, a great deal. The, the governor signed this bill in June of 2004. And as Eleanor laid out and I've said, it provides substantial financial incentives to communities that pass high density zoning in smart growth locations. Typically it works by passing or adopting an overlay zoning district that sits on top of the existing zoning. The existing zoning, for instance, might be commercial. Uh, the owner of the property can continue to develop the property with the existing zoning or they have the option of developing it under the 40R zoning or selling it to a developer who would do that. The smart growth overlay creates an as of right option for developing the housing. It's as of right, but it does require site plan approval, which means it's, the project has to go to the planning board or the site plan approver to make sure that it meets all the requirements of the, uh, of the ordinance. The requirements, it can be residential, it can be mixed use, 
Uh, the density requirements, the minimum requirements are single family at eight units an acre, two or three family at 12 units an acre, multifamily at 20 units an acre. And saying that, it is possible if you have a, a large site to carve out part of the site and leave it open space so that you don't have to take the total site and use these density requirements against the total site. That requires some uh, planning with uh, DHCD to make sure everybody's on board with it. But if you have a larger site, uh, you could make some of it restricted parkland and not have to make the whole thing at 20 units an acre. And affordable housing is required up to 20%. It must be 20% of the units, except in the case of smaller projects where the 20% can be an average for an area. The financial incentives are incentive payments provided when the zoning is passed before anything is built uh, so that the community doesn't have to wait for a developer. Secondly, there's a density bonus payment that's $3,000 per apartment that is um, available when the project is finished, when there's a certificate of occupancy. If a community passes a 40R district, they get a preference for state discretionary funds, certain grants like MassWorks and so forth. And finally, all the school children that uh, live in the new housing uh, are eligible for Chapter 40S school cost insurance. Uh, and the education funds are based on actual costs, not incremental costs to the school. So these are really pretty substantial benefits uh, and that can help uh, dramatically increase the support in the community to get a consensus that it makes sense to proceed with the project. The ordinance would include a designation of the boundary, the allowed uses, the allowed density, uh, how the affordable housing will work, and how the site plan review process will work. It also, the uh, 40R program allows for the community to set up design standards. So if a 40R district is being passed without a developer in sight, the city can or the community can develop design standards that designate what the end product will look like, um, the quality of the design, and um, this can ensure that the community gets a new development that is consistent with and compatible with and enhances the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, the developer doesn't have the right to just come in and do whatever he wishes. They've got to meet the design standards. And that's a pretty unique uh, requirement. I don't think there's any other uh, process in terms of zoning where the community, the planning board, a committee the community sets up can decide ahead of time of how they want the project to work. Now, that being said, the design standards can't be written in such a way that they make it infeasible to build the project. Uh, it has to be, they have to be reasonable, but it can certainly talk about what the roof shapes are like, the types of materials on the exterior, how the buildings relate to each other, the uh, et cetera, the massing and so forth. It really gives a tool to the planners so that the, and the community so that the community can in fact control the way the community grows in the future. Uh, allowed uses, there's quite a lot of flexibility here. Yes, residential, yes, multifamily, but also mixed use. For instance, in Linfield, a developer, national development as a matter of fact, a large developer owned the Hilton Hotel, which included an 18 hole golf course next to it. So, a 40-yard district was proposed in which half of the golf course would become a large uh, modern shopping center and with about, I think there were about 200 units of housing that were built. So the housing was really a small piece of the project, but the zoning that allowed the new project was all done under chapter 40-R, included extensive design standards and uh, allowed the community a great deal of um, a great deal of say in how the project was developed and used. And um, I think that's been, this, this process has been used in other situations. So 40R provides 
a great deal of flexibility for incorporating multifamily housing or single family housing uh, into a, 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 new, a new community. Uh, in Kingston, for instance, a very, a very well-planned community was built and designed that included commercial, retail, single family homes, townhouses, and multifamily. Unfortunately, NIMBYism there, even with 40R passed, um, made it impossible to proceed with the project, which again speaks to how important this 50% plus one uh, new version of the, uh, of, the, of the approval process will be going forward. 20% uh, of the units must be affordable for residents uh, at or below 80% of the uh, uh, area median income. And in certain cases, the community re can require that 25% of the units are, can be affordable. Uh, as a matter of fact, the community could uh, require more, I think, under certain circumstances. But if 25% of the units are affordable, for instance, let's say in Wellesley, if 25% of the 350 units had been required to be affordable, then all 350 units would be eligible to count against the community's 10% affordable housing goal uh, with Chapter 40B. So this is an important uh, consideration that can also help develop consensus in the community because the community, again, can help determine what it's going to look like, where it's located. And if 25% of the units are affordable at 80% of median, then all of the units in the housing uh, count towards the 10% uh, requirement. Well, the site plan review process, uh, the permit granting authority is typically the planning board, but it could be the board of selectmen, it could be a zoning board, that's up to the community. Uh, there's typically a public hearing to review the ordinance and the design standards and the application goes to DHCD and which makes the determination about whether it complies with the 40R ordinance, whether the design standards are appropriate and whether the affordable housing plan is appropriate. Uh, there are a lot of controls that can be built into the ordinance to protect the community. Uh, the total number of units, uh, cap on the percentage of non-residential use, if it's a mixed use building or project. Uh, it, controls can be built in with regard to infrastructure adequacy. And again, as I as stressed before, design standards can ensure that the community knows what the project is going to look like when it gets built. Benefits of the district, uh, it can address needs of the local community as laid out in the community's housing plan. It may allow uh, regional needs to be addressed, such as Beverly did with Salem, Peabody, and Danvers. Uh, it can provide for certain amounts of affordable housing. And again, it can provide very significant financial benefits for the community, particularly if it's a larger project. Uh, projects of 300 units or more can generate over a million dollars back to the community, which can be used for whatever the community decides makes the most sense. Uh, the incentives that get paid when the zoning is passed uh, vary depending on the number of units. So up to 20 units, it's $10,000 total at 20 to 20 to 100 units is $75,000. It's 200,000 for 100 to 200 units. It's 350,000 for 200 to 500 units. And then over 500 units is 600,000. And a number of communities, including Fitchburg and Rockton got their checks for $600,000. Uh, when the project is finished, the community gets a density bonus payment equal to $3,000 per completed unit. So all of this provides really strong incentives for a community to move forward with the 40-hour program. And it um, allows for uh, a political process to take place in the community that results in a consensus so that a 50% vote can be obtained by the governor body, governing body, whether it's the selectmen or the planning or the uh, for the city council. I also would like to just run through how the school cost of reimbursement worked in Beverly. Uh, 
the average annual cost of educating a student in Beverly in 2017 was $11,600. Um, there were estimated to be 79 students in the roughly 80 apartments. And that means an annual cost to the school district of $922,000. While the property taxes by the project were only projected to be around 50,000. So you could see this being a very powerful argument to not proceed with the project because it would put the school system under such strain if it was allowed to go forward. And remember the Beverly example was 80 apartments focused on homeless families and all two bedroom and all three bedroom units. So there would be quite a number of children. And the payment from chapter 40S could be as much as $750,000. Plus what happens with chapter 70, with the way chapter 70 works, if there are new students in the community, then the chapter 70 payment goes up as well. But the point is that with chapter, with 40S, the local community is held harmless in terms of education costs uh, going forward. And it's a terrific incentive to enable a community to directly address their needs for uh, providing for families who are low income and also providing for families that are homeless. Uh, it really offers a template that hopefully other communities in the, in the Commonwealth will take up. So, Steps, submit the 40R application to the state for review, draft the design standards. There has to be a public hearing with the uh, governing body uh, following the receipt of the letter of, of the state approval, and then the vote of the governing body, which is, again, thanks to housing choice, 50% uh, plus one needed to pass. With that, let me wrap things up uh, in summary. Uh, the, the real goal and objective of Chapter 40R was to make it possible for communities to develop a consensus in the community towards building more high quality housing for people in the community who need it. Um, it's had good success so far. And with the new housing choice requirements, I think the door is open for great success in the months and years going forward. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to be here. And it's always a pleasure to uh, join with Eleanor and Barry in laying out these issues. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you uh, to our presenters. That was uh, certainly uh, very, very helpful. Um, we're going to now start uh, the Q&A. And I encourage everyone, I know folks have been added, um, have dropped questions into this as we have gone through uh, this presentation. And we're now gonna start our panel discussion and, and Kindle who is on here um, is going to bring up the questions that you all have, have asked and uh, get things started. We have uh, obviously Barry, Eleanor and Ted and I wanna thank them again for their presentation and ask them to unmute their microphones at this point so we can participate and hopefully um, get started. So Kindle, if you could uh, go ahead and, and share some of the questions um, and let folks uh, get that going. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, lots of great questions coming in. Hi. Eleanor, Ted, Barry, uh, so glad to have you guys here live with us. Um, I know we have a few questions that um, are about specifics for um, how communities are, are designing their design standards. So I'm gonna give kind of two together and whoever wants to can jump in and answer. Uh, we have a question about the affordability threshold. So can communities provide for deeper affordability than 80% AMI? and if they do be given higher, a higher score for DHCD funding. And we also have a question about um, efficiency standards. So can design standards include those regarding energy efficient efficiencies such as passive house uh, standards? Ted, that sounds like for you. Well, why don't, why don't, Eleanor, why don't you take on the affordability question? Okay. The, uh... A community could require and enforce a higher level of affordability, but 
I don't believe that would give them any particular preference at DHCD. And what a community would have to be careful about is that they're not requiring a level of affordability that means that a developer will find it difficult to come up with a feasible financial deal. So that becomes tricky. I think I would probably advise a community to mandate the legislative requirement of 20% at 80% a median, but indicate that they're open to greater levels of affordability if that can in fact work. And, and I can add that in Brockton, there've been several projects. We did a, a large <clears throat> overall, a large 40 yard district in Brockton. They got paid $600,000 and Trinity Development has built two projects there. Both have about 60% affordable and 40% uh, market rate. So that approach has worked well in Brockton and they were able to get the financing they needed from, uh, from DHCD for it. And, and I would say skipping to the second question on Passive House and energy efficiency, I think that um, there is, there's certainly nothing prohibiting that. And the issue would be whether DHCD might conclude that the requirements are so onerous that it would be impossible for somebody to build the project, in which case they would probably not approve the design standards. But if you did uh, energy efficiency requirements and could demonstrate that these operating cost savings from the requirements uh, would cover the additional costs, then I think DHCD would be comfortable in going forward. And that is something that in fact uh, is feasible, possible to do, I believe. Ted, I wonder if I could uh, ask you a question. <laughs> and that is, you know, if a community were to, you know, using the new housing choice legislation, approve a plan for part of their community be 40R, my impression would be today there would be a significant number of developers who would be interested in this, both for-profit and non-profit developers. And then I would assume the community could uh, work with the developers to see which developer might give them the, the, the housing plan that they would most like in the community. Is that correct? Uh, it, it all depends. Yeah, I mean, basically, yes. Uh, but it all depends on what the market rate housing uh, prices are in the community. In many uh -huh. gateway cities like Brockton, Worcester, Fitchburg, um, market rate housing is marginally feasible. In some, it's not feasible. Uh -huh. uh, but if you are out of the gateway cities, if you're in a community that has the high prices like you showed, uh, then there's no question that you could do the zoning and then you could ask for proposals and get, have a lot of choice in what you select. Thank you. Great, thanks all of you. Um, on to our next question from our uh, participants. Can 40R developments be infill or do they have to be a larger project? Well, I'd be happy to talk about that because we went to a lot of trouble to make sure that it works just fine for infill. And uh, in fact, um, I don't know that any communities have done this, but it would be possible to put a 40R overlay district on top of an existing community that had infill opportunities and work it out with design standards so whatever gets built is appropriate and allow for the density that's needed to make the deals work. So that would, it absolutely would work for infill. And actually I believe that there are examples of that, Ted. What I'm remembering is uh, Redding and Chicopee, I think both have areas of infill within their 40R districts. But let me just add one other thing. We've all touched on this, but I just want to emphasize the fact that 40R allows a community to identify where it would like housing to be built so that it's not at the whim of a developer coming in and forcing a community to accept a specific location. It's actually the opposite. And that's one of the big benefits of 40R. 
And before you go to the next question, I just want to take a second and recognize, I know State Representative uh, Jessica Giannino uh, has joined the call. I want to thank her for that, as well as uh, Newton City Councilor Andrea Kelly and Lancaster uh, Selectman Jay Moody. I think it's really exciting to see this interest from our elected policymakers and want to thank them uh, for taking the time and participate in this as well. Um, and with that, we'll uh, turn it back over to Kendall with the next questions. Could, could I add something to what Eleanor just said, which is, and I don't think we've mentioned this, in many cases to date, these districts have been uh, really the result of a developer uh, acquiring the property and then working with the community to get the zoning passed. And that is also an excellent model for how this could work because the developer can come in and, and negotiate with the community what it's going to look like, what the requirements are. And the developer, the community in that case is required to do what is always necessary, which is to mount a political campaign so that the a number of votes can be obtained to get it passed. And that's also a very feasible way to move these things forward. Great. Okay, next question. Can a community apply for local preference in a 40-hour development? There, there's a possibility to have some local preference, but it's you have to work it out with DHCD. There's a limit on what you can do. Great, okay. Um, so I know given all of the challenges that Barry laid out for us, there's um, you know, a lot of folks are concerned about affordability as they rightly should be. Is there an example of 40R being used to provide the zoning for redevelopment of a public housing site where the same number of units is preserved for very low income to match existing units? Uh, I'm not aware of one. Uh, it would certainly be possible under the statute. Uh, I, there's a big project in uh, Charlestown, right, at this point that is has that concept, but I don't think they've used 40R for it. And I think the, I think the city of Boston has several other situations in hand, but uh, there's no doubt uh, a community could, uh, could use 40R very effectively in, in that situation. Yeah, the one thing to be careful about is in most older public housing projects, the zoning is already at quite a high density. <clears throat> so using 40R, you're, you're kind of only given credit for the financial bonuses for more units than would otherwise have been allowed. And in many of these public housing redevelopments, actually the density is being reduced. So there's no easy one size fits all answer to that but it would certainly be worth exploring. Okay, uh, next question. What has usually been the biggest challenge that you've seen in a community getting a 40 r district passed? And how, how would a community overcome that challenge? Ted is laughing, so maybe he should go. Ted, this is for Ted, definitely. <laughs> for me, right. <laughs> Well, in every community, you have people who are not happy about change. And I, you know, let's just make it that broad. People don't like change. Any change is something that they're not happy with. And so if you come in with the idea of building a number of new housing units, almost regardless of what it is, there's gonna be some pushback. Now, the exception to that is in the gateway cities, which are all, uh, focused on redeveloping, in many cases, redeveloping their downtowns. They welcome more housing. They want more uh, market rate housing because that's what's crucial to the revitalization of the whole downtown areas. But in other communities, you'll often have some opposition. And so the secret is, the secret really is that on day one, uh, there needs to be transparency. There needs to be a plan. There needs to be outreach, there need to be workshops, you need to engage with community groups, you need to engage with the planning board, and you need to make sure that, uh, that you identify what the issues are and that you've got good, reasonable, and 
financially feasible responses to those issues. And I'd like to actually add to that. Um, one of the original concepts that Ted had and that we fleshed out was that a developer, and this was even more true in 2002 and three, who wanted to build multifamily housing was faced with sometimes five years worth of going through that process that Ted just outlined in trying to get some level of support for a project. Where a developer is not involved at the front end of a 40R process, 40R takes that burden off of the development community. And that burden is really faced by the town or city to generate that public information process to generate a consensus and to end up with the 40R district where a developer can pretty much just walk in, present a plan and build. I would like to just uh, emphasize that point over and over again. I, maybe it doesn't need it. But the reason why Ted, Eleanor and I really worked on 40R is we knew that communities across the Commonwealth were upset with 40B, which had, I think had been passed Ted, way back in 1969. The idea that the big state comes in and tells us what to do uh, in communities where they don't have much affordable housing. So the whole idea behind 40R and 40S is to make it a win-win for the communities, to make it a positive carrot so that they can do the right thing for the state in their community and benefit from it. And, and in a sense, what we're saying is, those communities that are doing the right thing for the state as a whole, providing more housing so that we can re keep our economy strong, they should be rewarded for their efforts. Now, for what's fascinating is we've already had a considerable number of 40Rs uh, approved when you needed a two-thirds majority in order to do it. Now, with the Housing Choice Bill, as uh, Ted has said over and over again, you need 50% plus one so that more communities will be in a position where majority rules, where a majority of the population or the town meeting or the selectmen or the city council wants to avail themselves of this new housing option, they'll be able to do it on behalf of the majority of the community. That's critical. Yes, thank you guys. This is a really great discussion. We have a lot more questions coming in. I think we have time for maybe two more. Um, so let me see if I can combine some of these. Um, does chapter 40R add any opportunities for first time home buyers? And then also I love this kind of piggybacking off of what Barry just shared with us of, and, and also Ted during his conversation about how um, we're having a very different discussion than we might have had had uh, housing choice not passed. Um, with the requirement to have more density near transit, could 40R be a good tool to use in one of those areas? Well, the short answer is yes, there are opportunities for first time homebuyers and near transit has always been a major driver of 40R. One of the things that I've been so excited about in terms of 40R and its transit orientation is that we have many issues that we face in the Commonwealth. The economy is important. Congestion, particularly after COVID is over. And so by linking this to transit oriented uh, regions and areas near mass transit, near intersections of major highways, we hope it will be possible not only to provide the housing people need, but to do it in such a way that we don't increase congestion and perhaps even reduce congestion, making it easier for all of us to get to work or to the supermarket. Okay, one final question for you guys, uh, just keeping time in mind. Uh, so I know we have folks from all walks of life, all different towns and industries joining today. We've had elected officials, developers, realtors, and community members who just care about providing more affordable options in their town. So what is one thing you guys would suggest uh, for folks 
on the call today, if they think of a great spot in their community for one of these districts, what is something that they can take with them from this and, and do? Well, they should speak up. They should tell their elected officials that there's this great state program that can bring all kinds of benefits that can help to drive a community consensus, which is difficult to get in most places, and that they ought to look into it and pursue it. And one way they can look into it is uh, in the days ahead, contact Housing Forward, check out the website, um, call Josh, um, and get a hold of us and we can give you some help uh, on a voluntary basis um, to move this forward. That's, that's terrific. I think that's terrific. Those are exactly right. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I'm going to be pleasantly surprised and pat ourselves on the back for concluding at 1259. Uh, I want to thank <laughs> everyone uh, who joined uh, and spending some of your time today, uh, probably your lunch hour with us learning about Chapter 40R. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, for Housing Forward to have uh, hosted this event. I want to thank Eleanor, Ted, and Barry, our panelists, and uh, Kindle, obviously, for helping put this together and for running the Q&A. I know there were some questions that we didn't have a chance to answer in this, uh, this hour. Please feel free to email them. Uh, to us and at info at housingforwardma.org. The entirety of this program will also be posted to, to our resources page on the website. Uh, if you registered for this event, which I believe everyone here did, you will get an email alerting you when that link is available. Please feel free to share it far and wide uh, and we will keep you posted on upcoming training events uh, from Housing Forward related to these very same issues. Thank you again uh, for your interest, uh, for your time. Uh, I hope you found this useful and have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday.